everybody. Thank you, Terry. Terry's in charge tonight. Um, we've got um, new streaming software coming in a couple of weeks, but we're still working with the old stuff, and it is apparently working. Peggy's here. Peggy's going to tell us about some of the cool stuff we can do with our astro images that will take some of what we do and show people who have who are um, um, visually impaired. And uh, it's it's quite an interesting concept. So uh, please hang on with us and, and see some of the other uses, things that you probably never imagined you could do with your astro imaging stuff. Um, I'm going to share some screen here because we've got some we got a lot of stuff coming up over the next little while here. Um, and you guys should know about it. Uh, for one thing, we're going to have a guest MC next week because Alex is playing hooky. I'm going to Oki Tex. I've checked the weather and um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be uh, in the rainstorm starting in Arizona. And uh, it looks like it's following me all the way to Oklahoma. So anyway, I'll be there. I am sharing my screen. Let's go to the astroimagingchannel.com where or dot org rather, where you're going to find some interesting things. One thing I want to make a stop over here at the program database. I talked to Wanda today, and Wanda said that uh, she's been working on the spreadsheet here. As you know, this spreadsheet has got all of the programs we've ever had, and Wanda's doing a marvelous job over here, filling in all the details about what the shows are. But we need some extra help. I mean, there are some what 400 shows now, and um, we're only we're back to 19. You know, 2019. We only started this thing after we'd been running for a while, and we need people who will volunteer to. You know, you're going to read, look at some of these shows anyway. Make some comments about them, uh, so that we can see what the shows are about, and people can just click on it and they'll go right to the show. So we could use some help doing that kind of stuff. Um, and there's other ways to get a uh, copies of what the shows are, uh, so that you can see it's a very rich database full of, full of materials about astro imaging, lots of different kinds of programs you can look at because like I, you know, we've been doing this, what, seven and a half years, seven and a half times 50 is what, 400 or so, um, uh, shows that we have for you. So, um, you know, we need some help categorizing it. We need a good librarian to get a hold of it. Rory, Rory Clark, who you've heard give a couple of presentations, will be telling us uh, he'll be doing the TAIC workshop. Eric Calls has kindly donated some data, and you can get to his data, link to the data files here. We've got about six or eight people now have processed his images and the comments from the people who are processing is that it is excellent data really low noise data beautiful easy to process so if you want to get some experience um down with some really good data um go ahead and click this and you can download all his files process them up and then when you're finished click here to submit the file and it'll your email browser will open up and just send us a jpeg or a png 1080 on a side don't send us bigger and you don't you know don't make it any fancier than that because that's all the more we can use is what fills the uh, computer monitor screen um and send it to us so that we can um share it with other people and we'll ask a few of you maybe to come in and uh, process that data with us on october 17th arno is here also uh, where is, uh, oh, there we go. Um, Arno, uh, did you want to say something or do you want me to tell people about TAIC shots? Um, Jeff, go ahead and just mention uh, we're, we have some we're, questions. We're, that we can, we can right now, we're, go ahead, Arno. Sorry. Or were you telling me to go ahead? <laughs> yes, no worries, go ahead. Okay, uh, Nebulae, the beauty of dust. As you know, we've made several movies of uh, images that you guys have provided for us. So please um, click here to submit your file and get them to us. And that show will be October, uh, you've got until October 31st to do that. So please uh, get yourselves in gear and get that stuff done so that you can participate. This thing doesn't work. This whole YouTube thing doesn't work. If it's just Eric and me and Tim and Molly and, and Arno, if, if it's just us guys doing it, the whole point of it is that we're sharing where it's a club. We're all in this together. 
Okay. So uh, keep that in mind. We need your help to make this work. We got Linda coming next week. Linda, you're still here with us. Uh, Linda came into practice beforehand. What are you going to be telling us about next week? Unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'm going to be talking about building um, an inexpensive all-sky camera and what kind of things you can do with it. And it's the sort of project that if mechanically inept me can do it, anyone can do it. <laughs> yeah. If Linda can do it, no. That, that, that's not that's just kind of stuff I usually say myself. Um, wow. Bruce Waddington, one of the uh, people that gets together to help uh, do PhD2, will be telling us about the guiding assistance the week after that. And then we're going to Western Australia to see some down under nightscapes. And we've got a whole lot of other things. We've got um, a couple of open dates here. Hop, uh, happy Halloween, everybody. And then November 7th, we've got an opening. We need somebody to fill that opening. So uh, hit the, the contact sheet and volunteer. Tell us what your name is and stuff like that. And uh, comment and tell us that you'd like to volunteer for something. And then um, we're pretty good all the way up until almost Christmas and New Year's. And then in January, we're empty again. So we are going to need to start beating the bushes, trying to get more people to present for us. Um, as you know, there's a whole room, a set of uh, area over here for you to make comments. While you're making those comments, you can make contributions. Uh, we really appreciate that. And I want you to know that it does us some good and it does you some good. We're about to spend a bunch of money on getting some new uh, software to make our streaming a little more efficient, um, a little bit better to do um, the, the way what we do here every night. So, um, and also, uh, we haven't talked about it for a while, but, um, oh, it doesn't say so on this particular screen. There we go. 11.6 subscribers. Uh, for Christmas last year, your Christmas present was to get us to uh, 10,000. And now we've got, well, 1.6 more thousand, 1,600 more. It'd be nice to be at 12,000 by next Christmas. So if you like the show, tell us you like it and subscribe to the channel for the future. Okay? Now, I think that I've said everything I'm supposed to do to get you guys warmed up and excited about coming back to the Astro Imaging channel. So it's time for me to stop sharing and invite Peggy. Peggy, can you tell us about yourself and what is it that you'd like to uh, tell us about, about uh, helping out people that they don't see as well as the rest of us do? Well, I'm Peggy Walker and I just recently joined the Astronomical League in 2017 and uh, took over an empty vacant spot for the children, basically. And they needed to do uh, family stuff at some of these conferences, or at least one woman was doing so. And with me being very right-brained and STEAM-minded, I had commented that maybe while we have these national conventions, you've got the high schoolers with the parent, what are the other kids doing? So that's kind of where I come from. I'm very right-brained artistic. And in 2015, I got very much involved with Noreen Grice's material. And from there, I had started putting things together and contacted the School for the Blind here in Oklahoma. And I was actually speaking at a conference for teachers of the blind in blind schools in the nation. And the problem was, is they basically said they don't have time for these type of learning um, extra things in their classrooms because they had a time schedule to get kids, to train them how to pass their tests so that they can get their money. You know what I mean? It's, it's all about the money at the end of the year. And they couldn't, they had a closet full of learning enrichments and none of them were interested in what I could share and give them in terms of science, you know? And so Noreen Grice really pretty much, I had a lot of her books. I would take them places and people would feel them. But I realized that right brain people are a little bit different and one of the teachers at this conference for the School for the Blind said, I can give an assignment to my students, the left brain students get the book, read the assignment, do the, they go straight into the worksheet. When it comes to, because I know who my right brain kids are, they read it and they always have questions. And I have to come to terms with how do I use verbiage that, they, that I can explain to bring the picture for them to understand the work. And that kind of got me going. It's like, how would a right brain person spark the right brain of a person born blind to be able to paint a picture in using their imagination. 
And so that's kind of how I got started in doing uh, things for the blind. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and kind of show you some of the things that I've done. And, you know, I'm not an imager, but I am, I love looking at them and there's nothing more exciting when I do the, the astronomical league calendar. And when people say, Oh, here's my astro bin. I mean, it's like um, candy, you know, at a candy store. And so I have um, basically gotten all kinds of images from everywhere. And I am just elated when people let me do that. You know, I can go in and, and use their information. And, and it was interesting that you talked that you're going to Okie Techs. I actually had a woman uh, con uh, get my name to hunt me down at Okie Techs because she said that in her club, they were aging out and a lot of people had uh, eye issues and, and visual issues and they were having to sell their telescopes because they were no longer able to do what they were doing before. And she was told to hunt me down. So we met, we felt kind of in passing and I took some of my stuff there to the Okie Techs and I showed her what I was doing and her mouth dropped open and I said, you know, I think that if you make something three dimensional and if you have people that know the night sky, this would be a way that they could still stay engaged in astronomy and not feel that their health or their bodies kind of betraying them and, and totally having to get them out of this hobby. So I went ahead and I started bringing her. So we started looking at some of the things I made and like this particular one was about the asteroid orbits. And I just took a picture how I got started basically was looking at concepts that I thought would teach a great scientific um, premise. And then uh, using different materials that were to actually very, very, very different from each other. So on this one, you can see I have a very small cord. Then I go into a small little stream of beads and then I go to a sequence bead. Anyway, I made it all tactily very, very different because they all from my understanding, their fingertips are very, very sensitive. And so the more in interesting it is, the more they, they um, would like that. And like I said, some of them were challenged when I gave them the, had them look through Noreen Grice's books and you've got ridges and things and they did not know how to, I could tell these were right brain people. And we do know right brain people lay in data in their brains, like an ICAD program, it's 3D and it's laid in with emotion versus the left brain. I did a talk on this, actually. The left brain get brain lays things in kind of like a file folder and kind of like how like a, like a computer would do it. And so there's no emotionality attached to it or anything like that. So we definitely have different brains. So if somebody is born blind and they've never had this visual experience, we have to pursue other things to, to create a picture in their mind. And for the example, this one here, was two t two tops of a TV tray that my neighbor threw away. And so I, this is repurposed. And this is about orbits. So you've got a screw in one of them to make a concentric on the left side. And then you've got two screws to make the, the elliptical. And what I do is I bring lar other lengths of string. So some of it is smaller, thinner yarn, some is thicker, but they're different lengths. And I figured that their arm going around in a circle versus going in an elongated form, they could literally feel what an ellipse or concentric orbit feels like physically. And then on the back of these panels that I do, these are larger panels, I actually have in information and on there. And in some cases, I've actually been blessed to have somebody uh, give me a braille for my narrative. With, and you'll see some of those down the road. And uh, Hale Bob, I mean, a comet, how fun is that? So I took this NASA image on the right and took different types of glitter. Some were glitter smooth and the other stuff is, is basically glitter, foam core, tool. I used kind of a quilting thing in the middle and then a pearl or a marble. And the, I literally glued on top of these because I needed to just uh, these are my very first ones that I did, so they're very pretty much uh, primal in what I've done, but just taking things and trying to make it look like what I see. Uh, this particular one is pretty interesting. I, I just, you know, I made this so kids could actually throw this one, but you could give them, give uh, visually impaired 
a bit more of an interest showing how long some of these trails are. The tails are different lengths. You can make, now I minded not everybody is totally blind, some are just visually. So you still want to, the co adding color to things is still uh, a, a good thing to do for those that are maybe just visually impaired and not totally blind. And so this one I did uh, just to give them an idea how the different tail lengths are on them. And I graduated the, the length of measurement for each color that I put on there. This one got very, very good rave reviews with the Tulsa Council for the Blind at their meeting. I took uh, several of these with me. And this is the structure of a comet. And when they were feeling these things, she's like, oh my gosh, I totally understand. And when you tell them the comet comes on this type of a curve, they've got this nucleus, they've got this coma. And the great thing about it is this woman, when she got done and she was so elated, she hands it to her friend. She goes, do you want to see this comet? And so uh, it was a great night. It was all beta testing uh, for some of these objects. And, and mind you, a lot of these things, too, work for ADD kids because ADD kids, I know this from personal experience, we are tactile people. We love touching stuff. We learn better from touching. And so this particular idea came to me at 1 o'clock in the morning about a comet necklace. And you don't necessarily have to be visually impaired for this. Uh, this one I do a lot. I get a lot of reviews on it. Just a big bead, and you've got yarn, and then you've got three different feathers, and for blind, I would actually go in and maybe put something on that quill of that uh, feather to delineate, you know, whatever bead strand that they are. There's three different type of tails attached to this comet. Uh, this one, <laughs> I'm only because I'm married to a guy who does woodworking. And so I originally started with a NASA poster. And then I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if I could convey that this is what I see, and these are the cool, fun things that you could feel on the moon. So I have a poster glued to a piece of wood. On the left is an actual new moon cover for it. And then you see over here a piece of wood cut so we can see the waxing crescent moon. And this would allow them to feel what mare and what kind of craters and surface features that are there. And then we just keep moving down the, the line here. But this, let me get close up. I'll show you some of the actual things that I've done. Now, like I said, this is all pieces of wood on top of this big round piece of wood uh, covered with the NASA poster. This is my, this is the full project right there. So you can see that up in the black area where the mare is, basically it's black sandpaper. Then in the crater planes that were lighter gray, I used tool and then I used foam core and I flip flopped it because particularly when you get to the um, Copernicus and Tico craters, you've got a lot of wonderful aurora and shock waves stemming off of that. And you can see I built up some of the layers around the craters by adding you know different lengths or heights up on that. Does this exactly typify every single crater on the moon? Absolutely not. <laughs> But it should give them an idea that, you know, you have you can show them the marsh, you can show them the promontoriums, you can show them the crater train trains on there. You can they can show them all the different types of surface feature concepts that you can find on the moon. And I made it big enough so they can put their fingers down in some of these. And I actually use a um, set of uh, die cutters with my hammer. And so I could get these holes kind of deep on some of these. And so that's basically what it looks like. And then uh, the, some of the materials I have. And then, uh, of course, we've got to talk about craters. I mean, so I got the styrofoam ring, and then I got some clay, got gesso with sand, and some uh, aquarium sand or gravel, actually. And you definitely need to use um, foam glue because for styrofoam doesn't really stay stuck to stuff. But my goal was to, to have them feel the ejecta, to feel the stuff down inside of this crater, the crater walls, uh, you know, that these simple craters is what we have a lot, you know, on the moon. And if we could show them a picture and they could see these, this would be what the, those that probably wouldn't see as sharply could feel what that really looked like. <clears throat> Here's your crater basin. 
and using same materials, but this has a lot more gravel in it, but it has gesso with sand and the glue and stuff like that. And then the central peak in the middle of that double ring concentric ring. So you can really talk a lot of science on some of these, uh, the shock waves and what the concentric circles are on the moon impact craters like that. Why are there rings, stuff like that. So you can just open up the door for things. And then of course, uh, these type here have actually, it's the crater, it's actually not labeled right, but it's actually more of the um, terraced wall craters with the shock absorption where the walls have collapsed in. There's a lot more debris inside of them. And so that one was kind of fun because it's got steps on it, but it shows the shock waves that happen with the impact of that, that meteorite or the asteroid and how it jolted in that shock absorption created these type of walls. Uh, this one was planetary, and yes, Pluto is a tiny, tiny, tiny drop on the end there to give them a size comparison, to show them, you know, all the planets are not the same size and kind of where we rank in comparison to our solar system uh, family here. And then this one gives them uh, the internal structure of the different planets. And I did get one, I did get uh, somebody to give me some labels in braille. So the, some of the sets I have, have the actual name of the planet with a little tiny braille piece glued on there. And so the top ones actually are the, the ter ter terrestrial ones that are rocky because I start off with the smooth foam core and then I flip to a glitter, then I go to a sandpaper and then I'll start over again. So like on earth, which is green, you can see I did the sandpaper, I flip automatically again to the smooth core. And then the bottom ones, I start with the glitter, which is basically gonna be your gas. Gas, and I go glitter, foam core, smooth, and the sandpaper. So it just gives them a different, the more variety, the more picture it can paint in some of the brains. This particular panel is a recycled piece of wood from my husband's garage uh, about Jupiter's um, gaseous uh, bands and, and zones and the vortices on there and the great red spot. And, you know, knowing that the certain, the, the uh, helium ones are much taller than the uh, hydrogen ones. So the white ones are much taller than the other ones. I took <clears throat> braid and stitched it in circles to make the vortices. And here again, I got some sort of a tan colored, it's I think like hemp lace because you still, for the visually impaired, you still want to see that this is really significant, signifying the actual coloration that we see when we see pictures of Jupiter. And then on the side there, my little cheat notes on telling the bands and zones go in opposite directions. But in between there, you've got the jets that, that pro propel those cloud, the jets and bands. And so that particular piece is a You'll see them on Gothic costuming, basically, which is pyramid-shaped beads. They're kind of sharp. And so just to let them know that these tiny little jets control the cloud uh, formation and the direction that, that goes in the band or in the zone of Jupiter. This one, I love teaching Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. I do it all the time. And I even take this in with my mainstream kids and it presents pretty well there but here again i'm using glitter foam core and then if i want to smooth i just flip it over and use the smooth so if you're starting at the top with the the blue stars they are glitter then i went into a uh i uh, rotated between glitter and smooth and if you look into the yellow you will see there's a rhinestone smack dab in the middle there, because I'm gonna tell them that's where Earth is, Earth's sitting in there. And then I got all the way down to the orange and I had to give up because that's the smallest die cutter I had. And I had to go to something smaller. So I actually had to go to beads, really teeny tiny beads to show them getting down into the brown dwarfs. So uh, they are, they're able to see the life of a star, the size of the star and the white and the blue little dwarf that happens after the sun explodes. So that's kind of my, my list of ingredients there. I pretty much am a glue queen. If you need a glue, let me know. I am just 
I got tons of glue. I know I, I know how to use it. It's a, my weapon of mass instruction. This one particularly is fun because I use cellophane and not tissue paper. Tissue paper has a way of staining fingers and stuff like that. But for special needs kids, this one was really crazy because when you use cellophane, it's kind of noisy. So when we when I had this one out there, I had them run their hands over it and it actually made a sound and their eyes got really big. I said, doesn't it sound like fire? And so it kind of brought in a little different um, thing. And I did make a little uh, sunspot there. That little black foam core has a hole in it so they could actually put their finger in the hole of the sun on this one. And this one I came up with uh, out of my own head and I do, I actually did this over the weekend, but the one on the bottom there has the trim in the glitter foam core so that they could feel the difference in the paper cutting. Basically, it's all layered construction paper and you peel everything back. I use two different color, you know, um, pipe cleaners for positive and negatively charged ions in this electromagnetic storm. You put your, your um, earths in there to delineate what kind of size uh, sunspot they have. And for my mainstream classes, I usually have them, that's like a solar uh, minimum or solar maximum, depending how many we put on there. But uh, but to have somebody that's visually impaired, this still could work for them. That You could still get the idea of this huge thing. But then again, this is probably the most favorite thing that I carry with me. Even when I go into mainstream classrooms, it's very fun because everybody wants to touch it. And this weekend we celebrated Stuart Rosa's, you know, 50th anniversary of Apollo 14. And I, we had solar observing. And so I was inside doing stuff with the sun. And it was amazing because all the kids wanted to touch it. And the parents said, don't touch that. And I said, no, 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 no. I made this for visually impaired or blind people. It is to be touched. And I said, it worked. I said what's interesting is ADD kids really particularly love touching this and she kind of bent her head over like to tell me yeah that's my son right over here so i told him no he could touch it all he wanted to but this one took a lot of uh glue and a lot of energy because uh I, you don't want to have the beads with the holes facing up because this is the granular surface is just all like beaded and not doesn't really have the holes but i used the pipe cleaners for the convection currents that break open, that open up that hole. Uh, I sent this picture to somebody and they said, it looks like a tarantula <laughs> on my son. Uh, the, the, the loops and the uh, flares I used, quilters use this kind of film to make patterns out of. And so I just painted it and glued it in there. Uh, the bottom image you can see, I used some clays, silicon clay to make a smaller sunspot that doesn't have any um, things coming out of it yet. I've actually added to this sun by adding a green like a loop of like a lanyard or plastic loop so they can feel the actual electromagnetic field coming off of this uh, globe. And you do want to make your get a, a little ring and you put tape on it so you can actually have your thing gluing on that as you work your way around your your styrofoam globe. This one I think is about uh, 15 to 18 inches big. It's kind of heavy. And when I took it to the uh, Tulsa Council uh, leadership, the lady actually lives not too far from my house. She's like, I oh, I totally understand this. I totally understand the sun. I get this. So it was really cool to have somebody local to help me uh, get feedback on what I'm doing. Of course, this is the, you know, scores and, and they have styrofoam balls, but these are more foam core balls. They won't fall apart as badly. And actually, these were hanging in a um, library in a backdrop. I painted a, a sheet, and these were suspended because it was a summer reading program. So these have, have been hanging and done different things, but they can actually feel these are the summer constellations. Uh, then they can feel the shape on some of these things. Uh, can this, you, yes, yes. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the kinds of classes and you know how many kids are involved and, and where you actually interact with them? Well, I have I have gone to, like I said, I went to the school and like at this particular time with this next thing I'm showing you, I had offered to go down there every, you know, like a couple weeks to do a class. 
and they would get back with me. No one ever got back with me. I told the Council for the Blind and the other groups here, they always say, okay, well, we'll book something and get you in. And this was long back in 2015. So it wasn't because of COVID or anything like that. But from what I kind of am gathering is a lot of people in terms of getting science this way is for the adults particularly, uh, very intimidating to them. But I have not had success in having, and trust me, I've tried every group in this area and I, I've sent emails, I have called them, I, you know, and I will plan something, we'll plan something and I don't, I don't get that kind of response. I, I was planning for the School for the Blind to come to the Maker's Fair and I made this particular panel at the Maker's Fair. This is actually, I've got 15, 12 of these and I actually have the whole curriculum that would go with this. So this would take the place of a page of an astronomy book per se, because you could teach off of this for a long time because the bottom constellation is Hydra, Corvus Crater and Sextants. And I actually got out the okay and permission from Sky and Telescope to go ahead and just cop, you know, enlarge what they had instead of free drawing it. And so they gave me permission. And so I just enlarge it and we put it into the um, software. So it has the ecliptic, the bottom numbers you can see are braille squares to delineate that's Hydra. Then you get up, you get uh, circles and those are a, B, C, D, and E. And then I would talk about each star, the size, the color. And you can see even down in Hydra, we've got a couple of messy objects like M83 and stuff like that. And then, the, of course, the ecliptic, where the sun and the moon are in comparison to where this constellation is. So, you know, it's a situation where I'm still trying to get there from here. But for some reason... I just don't know. Oklahoma kind of is weird. I don't know. You know, a lot of times it's, you know, they just have done things a certain way for a long time. But I've tried everything I've known to do, which is why I, you know, I find ADD special needs kids find these very enthralling to feel. But I, you know, even to go back to the Tulsa Council for the Blind to get back in there, they're just not interested in um, having me back or having this type of a session done. This here is a way to delineate or show the Milky Way galaxy and the star constellations that we see in the sky. And they would feel the curvature of the sky because it's on this half sphere. And so you just go up the Milky Way all the way around to the other side. You know what I mean? So they could, and then I have an actual rhinestone on this one to show them where the galactic center would be. And, um, I mean, there's some things that are possibly happening here. We've got a building uh, that's supposed to be like a, uh, I don't know, I would say it's STEM, but it's a building that's going to be for innovation. Of course, anytime you talk innovation, it's always robotics, you know. And um, somebody had suggested that, you know, well, we're, we're going to invite you when we get the building done. So I don't, it's supposed to be done this summer sometime. But um, and I could probably start trying to do something again. The challenge is, is that you go to places that they close early. Like at libraries, they want you out at a certain time. It doesn't lend for you to get a lot of questions answered or to have that interaction with people. And then here's my M13. Use just tons and tons and tons of, of different uh, beads and shapes of beads. The blue ones are faceted. So they could feel, every time they feel a blue faceted, hey, that's a baby star. Those are really, really hot stars. And of course, here's, you know, the bead sizes you can... You use go as small as you can get to as large as you can get and textures on them. That's just really, that really gets their minds going. You can see them as they're feeling these things, you can see their brains going and they're just, they're just phenomenal to watch some of these people do that. And this one here, I mean, it's really, really simple and it's just pearl beads and batting and turquoise netting to give them that blue cue in the background. And, um, you know, this one I describe to people as if you've ever been in a pond or a lake and you've got a lot of stuff that comes around your ankles, well, that's what this is. And this is what this looks like. It looks like a little blue pond or a little, you know, beautiful pond and has all this 
squiggly stuff going into the center and it looks like seaweed or pond plants or whatever. And so sometimes that's where I have to go because blind from birth means that there's not, the verbiage has to be more imaginative to create a better picture. So then that's what I kind of talk to them about is this is a pond. If you're walking into a, a thing and uh, M42, I tell them, hey, this is like a pop, a big 1950s prom dress or a dress where you've got the top kind of really big and then you've got a big bow or something in the, 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 the waist, which is the trapezium. And then, of course, you've got another big flower down at the bottom, which is the Witch Head Nebula. But I have all the things twisted out and you can see here the detail of those where they can feel the trapezium and the Witch Head Nebula. But like I said, um, the other part too is, you know, they could talk to me about uh, how can you convey gas when you've got dots and dashes on a piece of paper, or, you know what I mean? And so they're able to go underneath and feel this as a fluid thing, you know what I mean? So, um, and then here's, you know, the Grim Nebula and all that. So it's, I, I mean, I'm, I have all this stuff and I'm ready to go. I mean, I have it where my plan would be is to have a room full of people bring all of these because so, see how they have the braille with them or if they're visually impaired, I have a written thing, a typed out thing in about 20 font. So if they could read it, it just needed a larger font that I would have them sit at a, a table. Everybody would get a different item and then we would just shift everything to the right, give them however many minutes and talk about whatever they're feeling or reading, turn around, boom, shift to the right again, and be able to have that kind of a conversation. And they'll get all kinds of different types of, um, you know, they'll get all kinds of different parts of the science all at the same time. So, but that's where I'm at. And I really do, uh, my favorite quote is about imagination. It's more important than knowledge. <laughs> so... Uh, these are all basically things that I have done. I've got maybe a few more out there, but I just kind of am needing to find the the whole um, group or people that I can get to where I want to have maybe a regular meeting with somebody, go and and you know start with something. But I thought those panels those acrylic panels that I made at the makers at the maker place would be all around a table. And then we could have a class. You could literally talk about those constellations and what's in them for a very long time. So I haven't gotten back and reached out to them again. And I think a lot of things have changed now that a lot of them are now getting more into technology. There might be more things that have happened to them since 2015 that might have opened up some doors for them. You know what I mean? So, but I, I have contacted everybody I know, every agency that's listed and they just can never give me a hard date to get in and work with them. But that's that globe of that sun, those kids are always grabbing it and touching it and stuff. And, you know, when I go into kindergarten, I, they do moon phases. I take the wooden one in with me. That one's touched all the time as well. So, uh, you know, and it's phone course, so you can wipe it off, which is great. So uh, that's it. That's kind of, you know, what I do with an image. When I see some images, I'm like, oh, wow, how could I convey that, you know, to somebody? So that would be, uh, but anyway, that's kind of what I do with your images and some, and, and that's the images. But for anybody that, you know, wants to get started in it, it really is just a matter of, you know, how would you best convey your image or the best part of your image and know what materials are out there? I, my, I have one room that has so much craft stuff in bins. You would think you're walking into Hobby Lobby or something. You know what I mean? So I always see things and go, oh, I'm gonna, I could use that. I recycle wire. I have tons of things ready to go in the works. But um, yeah, I just wish I had more of an audience for this, basically. And Peggy, someone uh, made the comment that they think that museums would be interested in these kinds of installations. Any luck in contacting them? Um, I will have to look into that because, you know, with everything, you know, these are tactile and now we've we're in an environment where you may not want to touch things, you know what I mean? So, but that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. You know? and, and there was another comment from John that said perhaps someone with a 3D printer could actually print out 
uh, something like a DSO, deep sky object, that might be a little harder to do with craft materials. Well, the thing is about doing 3D printing, it's all the same feel. That's what I was saying. In the booklets that, that I was using, they're just dots and dashes. They feel the same. There's no, there's nothing exciting because you're using resin. And resin's the same, you know, kind of thing. Now, I did do an installation out here in Oklahoma City. Well, I'm not near Oklahoma City, but we have a museum there that has historical books. The athletic department gave them $12 million to go get some manuscripts. And they have a lot of Copernicus, Kepler, and they got quite a few originals of Galileo. And so he was doing, they were doing an installation here in Tulsa, at one of the museums. And so they asked me if I wanted to do some of these with that, with that event, because we set up telescopes at the same time. And so next to Galileo's etching sketches of the lunar phases, I had my wooden moon thing with the kids. And that's what we did. And then by with the sunspots that Galileo did, I had, you know, my other thing there. So in, I did work conjointly with, with one museum so far. But like I said, now touching things may be taboo to some, some people, you know what I mean? So have you been, I take it you've been impacted by uh, the, the COVID pandemic? Well, I mean, everybody's got their own kind of realm of how much they want to let that absorb into their body or to their person. And other ones are like, come on, guys, can we get back to normal? You know what I mean? So and you don't know where people are at, you know what I mean? And we, we do have some people that are just not there yet, you know what I mean, to be open to anything or getting back to what we were. Uh, it's, it's forever changed a few people, you know, obviously. So right now, I, I'm not sure if I even have an audience or even a place to go with these, to tell you the truth. Even though those um, acrylic panels, easy wipe down off of those. That's all that is, is just acrylic. So fabric and stuff might be a little bit different. So at. do you separate out, say, a group that's here's a comment about uh, people that are autistic versus those that are visually impaired? No, because when we do outreach, we prepare for everybody. And I actually will ask, Anybody in a wheelchair? Do you have anybody in this? Do you have anybody, you know what I mean? So we kind of, we as we are predominantly sidewalk astronomers. That's our, um, I roll with John Dobson I, on the board of sidewalk astronomers actually. And um, I met him and I actually have some things of his that were his. So uh, it's um, wherever you can go to be where the people are. But the other part of that is go where the people are, but help them experience it. They may not be able to get to an eyepiece. What can you give them to feel or touch that would still be giving them an, some sort of an experience. You know what I mean? Do you have any events uh, that are, are upcoming that you'd like to make announcements for? Um, a lot of them were canceled. Uh, we were going to do a big star party and they canceled that. And so I don't have any big events. We just do our regular sidewalk events, you know, every, every month. And we just did a big event in Claremore, which is where that uh, astronaut guy was. And it was really fun because a lot of people get freaked out when you say, do you want to look at the sun? And they go, are you going to blind us? No, we're not going to blind you. You know what I mean? I'm not that, you know. But we did do that, uh, the, the sun spot with the big fabric sun on the floor. And it was really, it was very impactful with them. And of course, there wasn't too many sunspots out there to, to note. But when you start talking about, it's a, you're making an electromagnetic storm, they were just shocked because they'd never heard that phrase used before with the term sunspot. So it was kind of fun, actually. How big is that sun? It was kind of hard to get a sense. Um, of it. It's about eight or 10 feet. Of I mean, it's like three pieces of fabric sewn together. And so it fits on the floor. I think I've had about 40 sunspots on there at one time at a library function. So then, of course, you talk about solar maximum at that point. And then you pull off quite a few of them and go, ah, that's a solar minimum. And so, yeah, that's. And the kids like to sit next to it, you know, and be near it when they get their pictures taken. And and uh, the ADD kids in particularly, they are, um, they may not be able to cut and do some of the things that you're wanting them to do, but but they like the end result. You know what I mean? To them, that's just amazing for them to watch them feel that. And and so every time we go, if we do solar observing, that globe always goes with me. 
And uh, sometimes if we've got moon phases, I might take the wooden panels with me for the little guys to be able to see, you know, up close and personal. But I just wish that there was more of a desire to get more of the science kind of into uh, the blind and visually impaired. Because when you look at the, uh, you can go to the Cornell University and pull up the disability status and they run it every two years. And I did the numbers originally to 2016. And when I went back in 2018, boy, have they doubled or tripled in the, their size. And I started thinking about it. They break it down by age group. They break it down by a percentage of blind, visually impaired, to um, deaf, uh, to special needs. So you'll know in your state exactly what the percentage is that's in your community. And then it also talks about how deaf people usually can get into engineering jobs and get into other things because being deaf is not as as a handicap as being blind. And even talking to the council for the blind, she said, you know, you don't see blind people usually in sciences because those concepts are, uh, especially when you get into physics, a lot of times it's 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 you got to see a visual thing and to convey something and they haven't had a chance or a way to present these things to us to get us there, you know? And even though, um, was it Robert Pollan, the guy that uh, ran SETI for a while? Um, the guy that was in um, Contact, that movie Contact, the blind astronomer. Uh, actually, he was born in El Reno, Oklahoma and he was preemie and they put him in a hyperbaric thing to have him live basically. And so it, it damaged his eyes. But he became the, in charge of SETI, and even though he was blind. So anyway, so I mean, it is doable. And I know there's other people. I've seen other people doing great astronomy things. But the engagement here in Oklahoma, unfortunately, I'm just it's still kind of a, it's still a little bit difficult to get there. So. Do you have any uh, online resources that people who might have uh... Kids that would benefit from that can go to anything you'd like to promote a website, a Facebook. Well, I page? don't have anything. I mean, I personally don't have supplies or things to send out to people. But if they want to get a hold of me at the um, Astro League um, underscore Steam at Cox .net, then I'll be happy to send them photos and maybe some of the descriptions that I have. But I haven't. Because of being an outreach group and not necessarily a club where we would have a whole web page of everything going on. And right now at the Astronomical League, I am planning a uh, conference uh, for the kids, the first conference we'll ever do. And I'm planning eight um, uh, building telescopes, with, hopefully with Rob Teeter, in 2022. And so I've kind of got that in the burner too, so right now. But I would be happy to talk to anybody. I'd be happy to talk to any clubs about what I do and maybe how to get them started or even walk them through how to do one. You know what I mean? If they want me to make that cellophane star or sun, you know, I would sit there and do a, a thing and with the glue and do it in person if they would want, if they wanted something like that. I started to film a lot of my things and I haven't posted them all up yet. And uh, things just, you know, when everybody, my daughter got sick of COVID and all this stuff, you know what I mean? So we kind of just had to stop doing that and, take care of other things, but I'm thinking of maybe going back and actually making videos on how to do these things and then make those available to people to just download and, and figure out how to do them. So that'd be a great idea making videos. Yeah. And, and I want to point out that the um, uh, address, the, the email address that Peggy referred to is yeah. in our comments section. Yep. I, I shared it in the chat. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I've just been doing this since 2015, but my goal was to bring it into the Astronomical League to have them be more mindful. And I had uh, the, a lot of the planning that the Astronomical League is doing with all the videos was, was what I had planned for the year. And I had asked uh, Noreen Grice to join us. And uh, a lot of them had never thought about doing tactile stuff. And she has a book called Everyone's Astronomy, and it is uh, in its second printing, but it's now in a new in, enlarged section because she's now added autistic children into that book. But she talks about how can your planetarium, how can your observatory 
change out things in order to make it more accessible. And she talks about a telescoping eyepiece that is like the stuff off the back of your dryer. It just bends down and it can go right to a wheelchair. And all the different aspects of um, how to take your images, put them on a, um, getting a special uh, 3D uh, printer, a foam, actually it's a swell printer or thermal printer. You gotta get the paper, you print your ring nebula or a phase of, of the moon, whichever, and then you have to convert it so that, you know, in, in the black is what's printed and not the white. And then you print it out immediately onto the swell form paper and you literally can hand it to them to feel the moon phase at a star party. So that's what she talks about. But it's everyone's, or no, it's everyone can do astronomy, everyone's universe. You can totally get all of the stuff in the back. She talks about how to do um, some of the audio things for a planetarium, um, everything. I mean, it, she's just upgraded that book. It's a great, great book. And so I'd recommend it. So even if clubs could just do it for the star parties that you do every week that you do or every month, you know what I mean? But but even the aging population in clubs, you know what I mean? They're they're at a point where some of them, I believe that's why the numbers jumped really high because you've got the um, the baby boomers. A lot of them are aging out, having situations because I know Oklahoma's numbers doubled since 2016. And so I had to look at that and I think it was just the aging population of that. So you can still keep your seniors there are people engaged, even though, you know, macular degeneration or diabetic retinopathy, because they still have the science. They know the science. And like that lady in Tahlequah, she came, she said that what they did is she, um, they, these are, um, these are observing wives, widows, basically. And they go to the meetings while their husbands do astronomy and they crochet and knit. And when she, she told me when after looking at them, she said, we, the quilters are going to start making these. And so the group turned from women that were just kind of there with their husbands to actually making these items so that their husbands could even talk about them because they weren't really the ones involved with astronomy, but they would make them for their husbands to be able to, to talk about them so that they can stay engaged in astronomy. So there was just, it was just so many awesome things that can go forward with this and different dimensions or different ways you can look at it. But I'm, I'm going to, I'm hopefully when I can get some videos going and get those up online, maybe that will kind of get people rethinking uh, things. When I do the conference in, in uh, New Mexico, Albuquerque for the Astronomical League, I will be bringing things that will be tactile for uh, those. Because we want to open it up to all kids. Because in families, you may have one, you know, or two that it's always like you go to the museum and all the other kids are hanging off the chandeliers and the one that special needs is pretty much hanging on to the stroller. And they don't have that great of an encounter like the other, their siblings do. So this way, we're looking at trying to get um, the whole family to come in, sit down, and everybody can leave with some sort of experience about astronomy. So that's that's my master plan. I'm gonna, <laughs> so that's what I'm trying to work towards right now. So, But it's all images. I get inspired by all these images. So that's what it is. I don't image but i love looking at them so okay yeah thank you very much for bringing all that to us yeah, um, we have a tendency to think that um everybody's like us right. and not everybody is like us and some people have different needs i know that the first time i was at a meeting of one of my local clubs the pomona valley amateur astronomers every year at least before COVID, they actually did an outreach with telescopes and video projectors and things like that for people yeah. that were visually impaired. Yeah. And I couldn't understand how does that work? I mean, astronomy never made sense. But with people like you and people like Joe and the other people in the Pomona Valley Club, that they, they made me realize that, yeah, there really is a lot of stuff that, that we can do where we start with our images and maybe make them a little more friendly to the people that don't have the same um, eyesight and hearing yeah. and various other things. So thank things you very would, much. Yeah, one thing I would love, love to do would be, because I have already kind of started my own curriculum. And um, so I have worksheets and things that I've taken into schools and stuff. And I thought, well, it would be so cool if I could take this thing that I'm doing. And, you know, if there was a way to have imager that would image the constellation for me, 
I mean, you can get it from Stellarium, but then you have a circle. You don't have the nebulosity in that, like an Orion's belt. We can see that. And to me, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if they could feel the constellation and go, wait, what? that's a funky thing. What's that? Oh, that's a nebulosity. Or what are these? Oh, those are the double clusters. And to actually have the actual objects in that and where I could print, where they could print it out on that swell paper and have that to go in conjunction with. So if I wanted to do a live class, I could do a class with, people that are sighted and then those that are visually impaired at the same time, you know, in a family, let's say, you know what I mean? So I just, I, since I don't image and I don't do that, I don't have that, but that would be to me, that'd be a great fun partnership to, to have the, to run those concurrently in some sort of a curriculum of some sort. So that's kind of my, that's been rolling around in my brain right now for that. Thank you for bringing your passion to all of Thank us you. here on the Astro Imaging channel tonight. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think that pretty much concludes what we're here for tonight. Thank you very much. Next uh, week, Linda's going to show us about the All Sky Cam. And um, then we'll be coming back the week after that with uh, some information about PhD. If you have any PhD two questions, I'm sure that we'll get them all answered for you that time. Mm -hmm. And of course, remember to you know check in and volunteer. This is your club. You've got to make a contribution to make it really work. So I think I'm going to be turning it back over to Terry here. Terry, are we ready to sign off? Oh, dear. The engineer.